Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Paradise is where people will rest. Till then, life will hurl curveball after another till death separates us from its soil. And having understood this reality, our predecessors would say, Adunya kulluha gumum, fama kana minha min sururin, fahuwa ribh. This world is grief in its entirety. So on the odd days when you are at ease, they would say, consider it a bonus. So never was life intended to be easy and expectations had always been managed by our Lord when he said to us in the Quran, We will certainly, certainly test you with a touch of fear and famine and loss of property and life and crops and give good news to those who patiently endure. Inflation, rise in cost of living and shortages of life's necessary supplies is one of the recurrent features of our world that has always affected communities. And ours of today is therefore by no means the first nor the worst to have ever experienced this type of plight. Let us zoom into the past very quickly. I want to share with you a few snapshots. Speaking about the events of the year 281 after the Hijrah, Imam Ibn Kathir, he said, وَغَلَتِ الْأَسْعَارُ جِدَّا وَجَهَدَا النَّاسُ حَتَّى أَكَلَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا فَكَانَ الرَّجُلُ يَأْكُلُ ابْنَهُ وَابْنَتَهُ فَإِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ He says prices, prices rose extortionately till people's hunger caused them to eat one another until a father would eat his children. So, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ He said. And then he speaks about the events of the year 334 after the Hijrah. And he said that the rises in, in prices in Baghdad caused people to eat dead meat, cats and dogs. And some details here that I have purposely omitted because I feel it will be too heavy on the ears of the viewers. And then he spoke about the events of the year 449. And he wrote of people who, would, who were forced to eat corpses due to the sh shortage of food. They found a woman consuming the thigh of a dog that had turned green. A bird fell dead from a wall, and at once five people leapt on it to eat it. It was that existential. And then he writes about the events of the year 462 after the Hijrah, and he wrote about the financial strain of the Arabian Peninsula that caused the Emir of Mecca to sell the gold from the curtains of the Kaaba, and to sell the Mizab, which is the golden spout that collects rainwater from above the Kaaba. And he sold the door of the Kaaba and made it into dinars and dirhams for the people. And similarly in Medina, the lanterns of Al-Masjid al-Nabawi were sold. Can you imagine? And the same can be said about Egypt, where the levels of hunger reached a level where the minister once dismounted from his camel and three men pounced at it and slaughtered it and ate it. And as a punishment for these men, they were crucified. By, by the next day, their bones were, were visible where people had gnawed at their, their corpses. In fact, people started to bury their deceased during, their, not during the night instead of the day because they were afraid that they would be dug up and, and consumed. So yes, as I mentioned, parts of this have purposely been omitted from the translation because of the graphic and, to be honest, the unbearable nature of some of it. That's a snapshot of the past. Looking into the present, fast forwarding to the 21st century, the cost of living crisis has yet again become the talk of the hour, with UK inflation rates reaching the highest it has reached in around maybe 30 years. The cost of utility, gas, water, electricity, as well as basic food items are, as you know, rocketing. And British economists warn of the biggest drop in living standards since the mid-1950s. And many will be left with very little to fall back on, where there's apparently no cutting back, no smart decisions, you just don't heat your home, you just don't use your cooker, you don't heat water, and you don't shower, you just don't do those things because you can't afford to do those things. And there was a study published by the Lancet Public Health that found that between 2015 and 2020, 10,000 children were removed from their family homes and taken into local authority care due to the financial crisis. 
So this is most certainly not a normal circumstance of economic turmoil due to a natural disaster, like for example the drought that affected the city of Medina at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. No. A lot of this is artificially manufactured and a product of the conscious decisions of men. Whether it's an un unjust interest-based economy, unequal distribution of wealth, where the world's richest 1% own 45.8% of the world's wealth, whether it's uh, structural inequality that prevents other countries from being able to catch up with the West, whether it's uh, manufactured wars, greedy bankers, so on. And as Muslims, our belief is that morality and the physical events of life, they are not interdependent. They're very much interconnected. So, for example, when sexual promiscuity and moral decadence, degeneracy become the feature of a society, a Muslim one or otherwise, then Allah will send his reminders. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, إِذَا ظَهَرَ الزِّنَا وَالْرِبَا فِي قَرْيَةٍ فَقَدْ أَحَلُّوا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ Whenever zina, fornication, adultery, and riba, usury, interest, appear in a town, become prevalent in a town, then they have brought the punishment of Allah upon themselves. Allah will send his signs. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Ya ma'ashar al-muhajirina, khisalun khams, idha butulitun bihinna wa a'udhu billahi an tudrikuhun, an tudrikuhun. O muhajirun, immigrants, there are five things with which you will be tested with and I seek refuge with Allah lest you should live to see them. And one of the five he said was what? لم تظهر الفاحشة في قوم قط حتى يعلنوا بها إلا فش فيهم الطاعون والأوجاع التي لم تكن مضت في أسلافهم الذين مضوا. He said whatever immorality among a people appears to such an extent that they commit it openly but plagues and diseases that were never known among their predecessors will spread among them. So our belief is that morality and the physical events of life, they are not interdependent, they are very much interconnected. So whenever sexual promiscuity, moral degeneracy become the feature of a society, a Muslim one or otherwise, Allah Almighty will send his reminders. Now, having said all of this, by no means are Muslims fatalists. Fatalism is an attitude that believes that everything that happens in a community or environment is beyond their control. And so it, it produces this submissive attitude towards these events. Okay, Muslims, of course, acknowledge that all matters are from Allah that, that serve a host of wise purposes. Granted, but the Muslim does not resign himself herself to inaction and freeing uh, themselves from blame using a metaphysical excuse. Our understanding of fate is not one which absolves human beings from the blame of sin or failure or the need to take action. Today, each one of us has a role. Let us discuss them. The role of businessmen towards their clients in addressing the rise in cost of living. Many will argue that usury is the underlying cause of the financial economic crisis that has crippled the world since the autumn of 2007 till today. Others will also level blame at the banks, which know that they can continue to lend recklessly, enjoying the interest they earn during the good times, and in their knowledge that governments will always cover their losses during bad times. The issue for me really is that these words, as true as they are, they ring so ironically when uttered by Muslim users of interest. Yeah, it's, it's true that your influence on these big macro financial matters may be somewhat limited, fair enough, but you are the master of your own decisions. So should you be voluntarily engaging in riba-based business, then consider yourself a contributor to the same crime that you are decrying. Allah Almighty said, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِ Those who consume interest, 
will not stand on the day of resurrection except like the standing of a person who was being beaten by shaitan into insanity. That is because they used to say trading is like usury. Whereas Allah has permitted trading and He has forbidden usury. Similarly, landlords are aware that the current lack of supply of property means that they are able to keep raising rent, having now reached the, the highest rate on record. A Muslim landlord, however, he has to be critical with himself and honest. How, how are people to manage this? How? In light of an economic crisis where most are barely able to make ends meet. I mean, is it not possible for tables to turn at some point in the future? In which case, how would, how would you wish to be treated if you are the one looking for property? So the Prophet وسلم, said, The merciful ones will be shown mercy by Allah. Have mercy on those on the land, and the one in the heavens will show mercy to you. La ilaha illallah. And the Prophet وسلم, would say, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ رَجُولًا سَمْحًا إِذَا بَاعَ سَمْحًا إِذَا اشْتَرَى سَمْحًا إِذَا اقْتَضَى Allah show mercy, O oh Allah show mercy to a person who is kind when he sells, kind when he buys, and kind when he makes a claim. That's number one, the role of businessmen towards their clients. Number two, the role of parents and children towards each other in addressing the economic crisis and a rise in the cost of living. The duty of the Muslim parent is to nurture righteous and smart and successful children, equipping them with the skills needed that will serve them in adulthood. And one of those skills is financial responsibility. I mean, frank conversations should start between parents and children, really honest ones, where the financial status of the family is candidly discussed and they should be made aware that the house runs on the income of the parent or parents. They have no other means besides that. They should understand that all of the needs of the house have to be met from that one pot of money. And then for children, help, help them prioritize lifelong healthy habits by, for example, dividing their income into three areas. You have a, a, an area for, for spending, an area for saving, an area for giving charity. For example, you encourage them to spend 50% and to save 30%, which teaches them to delay gratification. It, it gives them a sense of appreciation for what they want and will also provide the sense of security for future unknowns. So to, to save 30% and then to give 20% as charity, because children naturally, they love helping others. It, it nurtures within them the belief that they can make a difference to our world. Now, as far as grown-up children are concerned, who are living at home still, they should be encouraged to contribute to the household finances, even if they are living at home to save money. They, they are to realize that serving parents, especially during their hour of need, is a religious obligation. It's non-negotiable. It's one of the most rewarding of all endeavors. And it's your personal future lifeline when a similar circumstance unfolds to you. Allah said, يَسْأَلُونَ كَمَا دَا they ask you what they should spend. Say to them, whatever good you spend should be for parents. This verse will then list five different places where money should be spent. The list starts with parents. These children should also be told that expenditure on certain matters have to be given priority over others. For example, when the household expenses of rent, amenities, shopping are met, then okay, uh, we can look at the other requirements. Another example is instead of spending half your wages each month on just eat, learn how to cook something, <sighs> help out at home. This is much more of a responsible choice. So that's number two, the role of uh, parents and children towards one another. Number three, the role of Muslims towards their extended families in addressing our rise in cost of living crisis. Our postmodern neoliberal society is one that seeks to serve the individual, the individual alone. Social constructs of today have, have torn away family, tribes, community. And in doing so, 
it has also torn away a huge safety net for people, especially during times of a crisis. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, The deed that brings about the quickest reward is what? Upholding family ties. حَتَّى إِنَّ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ لَيَكُونُوا فَجَرَةً فَتَنْمُوا أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَيَكْثُرُ عَدَدُهُمْ إِذَا تَوَاصَلُوا He said, in fact, even in the case of a sinning family, should they uphold their ties, their wealth, and their numbers will increase. He said, وَمَا مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَتَوَاصَلُونَ فَيَحْتَجُونَ And any family that upholds its ties of kinship will not be in need of others. So as prices rise, and as the value of currencies plummet, Muslims are to remember that the money they spend on their families today is at its highest value with Allah. That's an intention to not waste. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in a profound hadith, Dinarun anfaqtahu fi sabilillah. وَدِنَارٌ أَنْفَقْتَهُ فِي رَقَبَةً وَدِنَارٌ تَصَدَّقْتَ بِهِ عَلَى مِسْكِينَ وَدِنَارٌ أَنْفَقْتَهُ عَلَى أَهْلِكَ أَعْظَمُهَا أَجْرَ الَّذِي أَنْفَقْتَهُ عَلَى أَهْلِكَ He said, a dinar that you spend in Allah's way, or a dinar that you spend to free a slave, or a dinar that you spend as a charity to a needy person, or a dinar that you spend in support of your family, the one that will yield the greatest reward is that which you spend on your family. Number four. The role of mosques towards the community in addressing the rise in the cost of living. The role of the masjid is central. Just as you have opened up your facility for Quran memorization and lectures, open up your facility for courses and developmental programs. Contact your local council. Access the pots of funds for, for apprenticeship schemes. Upskill your community. Imams, committee members, this is the hour where you will either gain the confidence of your community or lose it. This is number four, the role of the masjid towards their community. Number five, the role of the Muslim citizen in alleviating this rise in the cost of living. Without doubt, some are missing meals, some are choosing between heating and food, others are left with nothing but the clothes on their back. Contact your neighbors or at least a handful of those within your vicinity. Check on them. Offer them any of the surplus that you may have. And I love the hadith of Jabir, may Allah be pleased in him, where he said that whilst we were once with the Prophet ﷺ journeying, a rider came and began looking right and left, as if to ask for help. The Prophet ﷺ recognized his poverty and he said, مَنْ كَانَ مَعَهُ فَضْلُ ظَهْرٍ فَلْيَعُدْ بِهِ عَلَى مَنْ لَا ظَهْرَ لَهُ وَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ فَضْلُ مِنْ زَادٍ فَلْيَعُدْ بِهِ عَلَى مَنْ لَا زَادَ لَهُ Whoever has an extra mount should offer it to the person who has no mount. And whoever has extra food should give it to the one who has no food. And he continued mentioning other properties until we thought, Jabir said, until we thought that none of us had any right to surplus of his own property, to extra. Number six, the role of the awqaf in addressing the rise in the cost of living. With the demolition of the Khilafah, the Muslims lost one of their finest institutions, the awqaf, public endowments, that independently fund many aspects of Muslim society. Now you've got what they call the Jewish Federations of North America. And it's the name of an American umbrella body that represents around 146 uh, Jewish federations and over 300 network communities. They raise and distribute more than $3 billion annually through planned giving and endowment programs to support social welfare, social services, educational needs of the Jewish community. And that federation movement Collectively, they're among the top 10 charities on the continent. It's about protecting and enhancing the well-being of Jews worldwide. Where are our awqaf? The practice of waqf is no more as popular as it was in the past, unfortunately. And although the rich people from our community, alhamdulillah, and others, they donate abundantly during their lifetime, 
for individual or community causes. But in most cases, these causes are short term, which means that we've surrendered our charity to a similar fate, short term. So we are to revive this collective spirit of awqaf, and that starts with the waqf that you create. Number seven, the role of the callers to Islam, the activists, in addressing the rise in the cost of living. Whether you are a scholar, a parent, an elder, sibling, a community leader, or whatever it may be, we are all to spread good news, raise morale, uh, to promote certain pressing values amidst our sphere of influence. What are these values that we are to spread now? The first of them is istighfar, to say astaghfirullah, I ask for Allah's forgiveness, to make peace with Allah, istighfar. A man complained to Al Hassan al Basri about famine. He said to him, Engage in istighfar. Say, May Allah forgive me. Keep saying it. Another one complained to him of poverty. And he said to him, Do istighfar. A third person asked him to pray to Allah that he should be granted a child. So he said to him, Do istighfar. Another person said to him, I have a garden that's become arid. What do I do? He said, engage in istighfar. So they queried him about this. And he said to them, ما قلت من عندي شيء. These are not my words. And then he quoted to them the words of Allah from Surah Nuh, where Allah said that Prophet Noah said to his community, استغفروا ربكم إنه كان غفارا يرسل السماء عليكم مدرارا ويمددكم بأموال وبنين ويجعل لكم جنات ويجعل لكم أنهارا Seek your Lord's forgiveness, he said. He is the most forgiving. He will shower you with abundant rain and he will supply you with wealth and children and will give you gardens and will give you rivers. That's the, a value that is to be promoted now as people discuss this. Istighfar, istighfar, making peace with Allah. Number two, reliance upon Allah. Share this value with people. This crisis has exposed the extent of the modern day man's anxiety about the future. And in many cases, his lack of good thoughts towards Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَن نَزَلَتْ بِهِ فَاقَةٌ فَأَنزَلَهَا بِالنَّاسِ لَمْ تُسَدَّ فَاقَتُهُ وَمَن نَزَلَتْ بِهِ فَاقَةٌ فَأَنزَلَهَا بِاللَّهِ فَيُوشِكُ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِرِزْقٍ عَاجِلٍ أَوْ آجِلٍ Whoever is afflicted with poverty, and relies upon people for relief, his relief will not arrive. But whoever is afflicted with poverty and relies upon Allah for relief, his provisions will be sent to him sooner or later. That's the second value to promote. Reliance upon Allah to think well of him. Number three, a third value, Islamic economics. See, whether it's the Great Depression of 1929 to 1939, whether it's the financial crisis of 2007-2008, or our crisis of today, or the many that shall follow, from their ashes appears a golden opportunity for us to convey to the world our economic system and how it can achieve what the world needs and save it from the injustices of man. And my personal belief is that the role of the Muslim economists and financial experts of integrity today is arguably no less important than that of Muslim theologians and scholars provided that they don't bury their heads into the sand and instead play an active role in demonstrating the Islamic alternative model. I'll give you an example. Here in the West, Adam Smith is considered to be the father of economics and he's revered by both Western academics and in Western popular culture and government. Yet, as was noted by many academics, including David Graeber, an anthropologist, who taught in the Princeton and the London School of Economics, he said that Adam Smith got most of his best ideas and best lines from medieval Islam, specifically from Al-Ghazali and Ibn Khaldun. Both of him are suspiciously neglected in mainstream school textbooks. So, so it's, it's the Muslim financial experts who can cure the modern day Alzheimer's disease of mainstream economics by correcting historical narratives and by offering solutions for the future. And at the time of the next collapse of Western banks, the world will need a new hero. 
a way of doing business that is free from rampant speculation, free from excessive risk, and is banking back to basics, taking deposits from savers and lending to borrowers for a profit. The point of mentioning this is what? It's Muslim economists and financial experts who must drive this awareness campaign. Be innovative, dear brothers and sisters. Lastly, how merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He sends humanity these occasional wake-up calls at a time of worldwide slumber and distraction? It is these reminders that shake off from hearts the grime of worldly obsessions and forces our gaze back into the direction of the heavens in a reawakened longing for Allah and a renewed desire for the home of perfection, Jannah. We needed this. How true were the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Most High, who said, Kullu man alayha fan. Everything being on earth is bound to perish. Allah Almighty said, Wa hayatu dunya illa mata'al ghurur. The life of this world is no more than the delusion of enjoyment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wal akhiratu khayrun wa abqa. The hereafter is better and more enduring. And Allah Almighty said, وَإِنَّ الْآخِرَةَ هِيَ دَارُ الْقَرَارِ It is the hereafter that is the home of perpetual residence. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.